think like little tiny snippets would be great. I I know if she records it, something will actually become of it. If I do it, it'll just stay in my in in my thing. Yeah, I'll record it and then I'll share it. So <laughs> should we start? Sure. sure. Okay. I can, should I be the one in charge of letting people in? Yeah. Okay, cool. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. So we're just gonna give folks just maybe one more minute to come in, but um, this might be a smaller group. So, but that's great too, because, you know, even just having a few of people is, is what this session is all about. So yes, thank you for, for being here. Um, and just so you know, we are gonna be recording this, um, but if you feel like you don't want us to share it out, just let us know. Um, we want this to be a safe space, but we are just going to record it just so we can have it as either a memory or something to use in our stuttering advocacy. So um, I guess we can get started or do, do you guys think we should, should wait a few more minutes? Um, I don't know where we are in terms of the conference. Um, so if people are, you know, kind of, yeah. waiting, you know, like they may have gotten late from another one. Yeah. So we'll give it a few more minutes. You know, I was just thinking, should we pin the three of us along with the interpreter? So it's like four, like one, two, three, four, like that. Does that, and it's more of a question for the interpreters and sorry to ask you this now. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. Because I'm thinking when we, oh, but will it let me? Oh, add a pin. Okay, got it. Because this will record better once we put it on video. Oh yeah, that's a good point. If, if that even matters, I don't understand how it all works, so. <laughs> <laughs> and is, um, is everyone okay with the transcripts, like the captions? <laughs> They're not gonna <laughs> be great on us, but sure. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh my gosh, what are they gonna? Are they gonna <laughs> do that? <laughs> uh, Zoom has to up their transcription game. Yeah. No, I, I met someone yesterday who was working on AI and stuttering. She was at a show. Um, since I'm a comic, for those who don't know, and um, and she was like, oh yeah. Studying AI and stuttering. And I was like, whoa, wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. And I do have an interesting story about AI and stuttering in podcasting that I can't wait to share as we. <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The podcasting industry is very ableist. Oh, I could And especially. <laughs> voice wise <laughs> yeah but I'm not I'm trying not to I'm trying not to use this as a soapbox to like <laughs> be negative about that right now <laughs> it would be um, so easy though <laughs> I know it's just so easy so I, um yeah, I do see I think you might want to spotlight each person to show the interpreter so is that like every time we speak that we get spotlit? Oh, um, what on mine, it's one, two, three, four. It's a box. So. Oh. Okay. 
should should I click on like my own box and then say add spotlight or is that how you okay <laughs> I'm doing it okay. okay now you guys have to do this. oh wait yes I pinned you guys and didn't spotlight you so yes okay, okay I'm so confused for you and I'm gonna add a spotlight. spotlight. No, I think they're all on mine. It's saying you are all spotlight lit, light, light lighted. <laughs> Isn't that, or is that not what not what we want? Yeah, no, I think we do want everyone's uh, spotlit. Okay. Then we're all spotlit. yeah, yeah. I think I see it now. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yay. Okay. Hello, Anita. Good, good morning. Hi, Anita. Hi. I was supposed to help with this session, so I'm sorry. I also got confused with the Zoom link. But oh, um, okay. if you need help, like with tech, I also have a Google Sheet that might help. But also, this is my first time, so just um, we can figure it out together. <laughs> sure. So it seems then that we are doing this for. TikTok or for you know whatever, <laughs> then, huh? Yeah, for okay. millions and of countless people on the internet. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to like make you myself look presentable. <laughs> since it's fine, it's fine. You look <laughs> great. <Maya>. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, I guess we can get started and as if, if people want to come midway, that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so since this is going to be recorded, um, I guess I'll start with a little intro and then we can get started. So I will start now. Welcome everyone to our panel for the Allied Media Conference. So excited to, to be here. Our session is called Stuttering Unapologetically, Finding Liberation Through Arts and Media. I am so excited to be joined by my amazing co-panelists, Gina Chin Davis and Nina G. And I'm gonna have them introduce themselves because they know the most about themselves. <laughs> so um, I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Maya Chupkov. I'm the proud, um, I, <laughs> I'm a proud person who stutters. Um, I'm the host and producer of Proud Stutter Podcast. It is a show about shifting the narrative around stuttering and helping others um, learn more about stuttering and the experience of those who are verbally diverse. We are, we just finished our first season and now we are about to launch our second season later this summer. And I'm actually, at a stuttering conference right now. So it's the morning of the day three. So I'm just like in the stuttering vibe right now. So really happy to be here. Um, and I will pass it over to my co-panelist, Nina G. Hi, um, it's great to be part of this. My name is N N Nina G and I am a stand-up comic and an educator and an author author of the book Stutter Interrupted, the comedian who almost didn't happen among other books too. Um, so I started to stutter when I was eight um, and haven't stopped since. Um, I'm, I am a stand-up comic of 13 years and do that pretty consistently um, and travel um, across the world either as a keynote doing colleges but mostly performing in in california and gina take it away hi everybody um it's really great to be here my name is gina chin davis i'm the person who stutters i started stuttering at the age of four and um, I'm a writer and a filmmaker in the San Francisco Bay Area, which is my home base, hometown. Um, I made my first feature film, which was called I Can't Sleep. Uh, and it was released in 2020. I wrote, produced, and directed it on a micro budget of $10,000. And it went on to win um, Best Script at the Boston Sci-Fi Film Festival. 
Um, and it won best sci-fi film at the Midwest Weird Festival. Um, I've also been published. My short stories have been published in various uh, magazines and journals and things like that. Um, and I'm really happy to be here and to participate in this conversation about stuttering and the female um, artist experience and finding liberation through art and media with you guys. All right, so let's get into our first meaty topic of just talking about us being women who stutter and um, navigating this world of being creators, artists, comedians, film makers, podcasters, like how, how do we see, like how has our journey been as female artists who stutter? And um, instead of me going first this time, I will pass it over to Nina to start us off. Um, so my journey has been a really long one, which is why I wrote the book. Um, I, my passion always as a kid was to stand up comedy. When other girls had crushes on new kids on the block, I'm significantly older than the two of you. But when other girls had had crushes uh, on new kids on the block, I had crushes on local stand up comics. Um, <laughs> and so it's always been my thing that I've loved that I've always knew more because as a kid who stuttered and had and has now also did 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 dyslexia. Um, I did not have a fun time in school. And in fact, what I tell people is that you should never pity me for having dyslexia or stuttering or a, a disability, which is how I uh, identify. Um, and, but, but you can pity me. You can pity me for stuttering and having dyslexia in Catholic school in the 1980s, because that sucks. That was not fun. Um, so for me, school was really hard, but stand-up comedy was one thing that I always had, um, always loved, and always knew more than everybody else. Um, when I was around 11, 12, I was like, I want to be a stand-up comic. I would write jokes. I would call up open mics to track who allowed who who to track who allowed minors. Then when I was around 17, dream just died. That was it. Um, and, um, and I still loved comedy. And any time that I had to write a paper in graduate school or in college, it would be on comedy, which I eventually wrote a book on comedy, on the history of Bay Area comedy. Um, but doing it never seems like a possibility because of my st stutter. Cut to when, when I'm 35, when I went to a conference for people who stutter, which Maya is at now, um, that is when I came back and I realized how much I had a lot of internalized stigma around my stutter. And even though I thought that I took care of it because like, oh, I worked and I, and I taught classes in college and I was pretty open about my stutter. There were the things that it, 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 it impacted me personally. And that's why my book is called Stutter Interrupted because we're interrupted all the time, but it was when I interrupted myself, that was the thing that really um, was the most de detrimental, it's the most de detrimental thing in my life was that self-interrupting. Um, so after I went to that conference, I realized how much I had internalized that, how much, especially, especially as a woman who stuttered, because women are socialized to make ourselves small anyway. And then you put stuttering on top of that. Like it's, it's such a great excuse not to interject and not to put yourself out there. Um, because the world has told us that we shouldn't anyway. Um, so after that conference, I came back, um, made a number of changes in my life, including ending a 10 year re relationship, all because of this conference. And then six months 
after the conference got, got on stage for the first time um, and started comedy. And that's been 13 and a half years. So this is up to this point. Thank you, Nina, for sharing your journey. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Gina to talk about her journey so far. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, as I mentioned, I started stuttering when I was four and um kind of at the time, yeah, didn't really know what to make of it. Thought it was just this weird thing that was happening to me and I would maybe grow out of it. But as I went through elementary school and things like that, um, yeah, I continued to stutter and some of my teachers noticed and things like that. Um and I went into speech therapy for the first time when I was around eight, like third grade, um, which, yeah, that's a whole experience I can talk about. But, um, but sorry, my cat's attacking me from the back. Um, <laughs> so uh, he, uh, um, so I, um, I really worked hard to hide my stutter, basically. I didn't like stuttering and I worked hard to hide it. And the goal, so this was in the nineties, the goal of speech therapy was really focused on fluency shaping basically. Um, and I think looking back, I learned a lot of things about my stuttering that, that were not helpful. Like they told me to make a list of words that, that I stuttered on, um, which is like shooting yourself in the foot. Kind of. um, and just like focus on breathing and all that stuff, which is fine, but ultimately didn't stop me from stuttering. Um, and uh, yeah, I so I'm a filmmaker and writer and I started writing stories when I was really young. I remember my grandmother and my aunt for Christmas when I was pretty like four or five gave me this like toy typewriter. <laughs> And I was, I just love stories. I loved like read, like my mom would read to me every night. And I wanted to write stories. And I remember I wrote my first story as a kid, at like five about like a magic fish on the typewriter. And I drew a picture too. And I would have my mom um, take pieces of printer paper and like fold them up and staple them and make them into books because I wanted to write books. So that was a passion of mine since I was really, really young. Um, and as I grew up, I would be writing more. And I think that for me, writing was a way of... Uh, expressing myself without the stutter in some ways um and it was a, just a way for me to have a voice that you know didn't have this thing going on with it that I struggled with and I struggled to understand it um but as I got older and uh, similar to Nina I, I had to go to private school so I, I went to public school through fifth grade and then um, private school where my misery began truly <laughs> um and it was very competitive. It was a whole different world. Um, the kids and the families were like upper class and I was not, I got in on a scholarship. And um, so it was just like, uh, I felt a lot of pressure like academically and socially to hide my stutter in that context even more. And I worked really, really hard too. It was really hard, um, but yeah, I ended up going to that school through the end of, uh, high school. But um, yeah, I got into filmmaking when I was in eighth grade and I hated school. And uh, my, my dad uh, has worked for many years as a television producer, writer, director, and he let me take a week off school. Uh, I remember right before Christmas break when I was in eighth grade to be a production assistant on his um, project that he was working on his uh, film project and um, I realized that I really really liked it and I liked being on a set and I was like oh this this is interesting and I got really into films then I was watching all these like independent films and um, so that's when filmmaking kind of came into my life up until that point I only thought I would be a writer um, so yeah I um I went on to hide my stuttering for a long time through college. It was really hard, um, but I, I hid it. Sometimes I couldn't hide it and I didn't know what to do when I couldn't hide it. You know, I had a lot of shame, internalized shame. Um, and then fortunately though, after, um, after college, I came back to the Bay Area and I connected with the stuttering community here. 
and that really turned things around for me in terms of like a different perspective on stuttering, the idea of not hiding it, the idea of um, sharing it or um, disclosing and just having it be a part of you. So I really struggled to internalize that. Um, and I've been in um, something called avoidance reduction therapy for a long time or yeah, for, for uh, several years now which I learned about at, uh, I think my, my second MSA conference, which was 10 years ago that I attended. Um, and um, so it's been a journey for me, of like gradually trying to accept and feel more comfortable, but you know, people would probably peg me as like a covert stutterer, meaning that I was able to hide it, um, but I'm more open about it now. And um, yeah, I just try to let my stuttering out when it's there and not, not hide it so much or not feel so ashamed and avoidance reduction therapy. And being in the stuttering community has really helped with that. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so my journey with stuttering has been, um, uh, I can resonate with a few things Nina and G Gina said, but like Gina, I, I started stuttering very young, around three or four years old. And um, it would come and go a lot. Like when I was younger, it was very severe. And then I'd go through speech therapy and it would be a lot more fluent sounding. And I'd just go through p periods of stuttering and then being fluent. And so there was just a lot of, turbulence in that way throughout my life but when I was younger um, I grew up watching the Lakers with my dad and one of the things that I always wanted to do is um, I would see the woman after the games interview the players and I I thought like to myself like I want to do that um, and and like a micro, like I always wanted to be on the microphone. I would sing like at any chance I could get, I would talk. Like I was just, I loved just using my voice when I was growing up. And um, even though I had a severe stutter as a kid, I still talked a lot. Um, but then once I started going through elementary school, like fourth and fifth grade, that's when there, the, the bullying started. And so as soon as the bullying started, that's when I went into like hide mode and I just wouldn't talk as much just because it was so painful to experience like the bullying. And so I think that's when I really started to be good at hiding my stutter. And I did go to private speech therapy that was very fluency focused. And I, um, and even though I didn't practice the tools, I think psychologically, I just became a better hider. And so there was a huge period of time where I thought I was cured. I thought my stuttering was gone. Um, and so I was able to do a lot of things that I never thought possible. Like I joined all these things that involved talking. Like I, I, I enjoyed more clubs. I was more talkative in class. And, um, and then I got so confident in my speech that I, um, be, became the broadcast journalist for um, my associated student body in high school. And I felt like I was finally kind of going towards my dream of when I was young, watching the, the Lakers and, um, and the possibility really became real for me that this could happen. And then, and then um, <clears throat> I was about to be on TV for the first time and I had a block um, and it came out of nowhere because this was like after years of not having to worry about stuttering and that's when the stuttering started to happen again for me and and then I kind of just went in hide mode like I didn't end up doing the broadcast journalism job and um, yeah so that dream was on hold for a while until um, I started the podcast with, with Proud Stutter. I feel like in my own way, I became um, like, instead of being a broadcast journalist that hid her stutter, now I'm able to, through podcasting, 
really show my stutter and be me, the less perfected, better version of myself um, through podcasting. And I, growing up, I, I always thought I wasn't a creative person until I started podcasting. And now I feel like I'm finally, like I consider myself a creative person because I am creating this amazing thing where I'm like helping other stutters share their stories through the show. And so um, that's kind of been my journey up until the, the, this point. Um, being a woman who stutters is really hard because um, I think as women, we are expected to be um, like, if we're, if we don't sound confident, I think it can really, um, it can really paint a picture of ourselves that we're shy and we don't know what we're talking about. And there's already so much um, stigma or not stigma, but um, there's already so much pressure put on us as women to be that confident person and to be successful. And, and I feel like my stutter has really, um, like what I really hate about it at times is it does make me come off as not smart or someone that's not confident or shy, which is like the opposite of what I am. I am not shy. Like that is not me, but I've grown up being labeled as shy because I stutter. And so part of this whole conversation is just really trying to help people understand stuttering and especially women who stutter, like just because we stutter doesn't mean all of these things that I just laid out. It's like, we are confident, powerful people and our voice deserves to be heard as much as anyone else's. So um, I think, so that's, that's kind of the intro to our journey. And I wanna shift it over to Nina who has um, some information, like more information about stuttering. And I think she has a few visuals for us. So Nina, if you think it's a good time for that, you can. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, stuttering is oftentimes described as the re 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 repetitions, which luckily I stutter on repetition so that people can see what kind of stuttering that that is as a uh, um and that is in addition to blocks which are more like that that blocks um and so those are the two kinds of stuttering that you oftentimes see i'm sure like what i've always heard is you meet one stutter you've met one kind of stutter because we can stutter in so many d different ways but to me that's like the least interesting part of stuttering what i really find interesting is more how we think about stuttering and there is a um theory from joseph sheehan that said that stuttering is like an iceberg that what everybody sees are the repetitions in the blocks but beneath the waterline is the bigger more substantial story of stuttering and he said that those are where the feelings around stuttering are and he said those included um de de denial shame anxiety guilt fear hopelessness and isolation and what i kind of hope to challenge people with is that yeah all of us here have had all of those feelings and we'll have them all again and but we but the feelings part is something that like i don't have control over my speech but i do have control over how i th think about my stutter and it's not that i i 
I have my own iceberg. I have my iceberg in transition and I have the iceberg that I hope to have, kind of the idealized iceberg. Um, but also everybody who works with pe people who st stutter, they have their own icebergs because we have been socialized to think that stuttering is a less than way of talking, that we are not as smart. Like There's all of those things that are built in. So it's really important for us to kind of take charge of those feelings that we've had and to transition those. And so the way that I've done that in part is um, rethinking Sheehan's iceberg. So where once there was denial, there could be acceptance, shame could turn to pride, thus proud stutter, um, and anxiety to kindness, guilt to comfort, and also guilt to forgiveness. Um, since, I, in, since I have this image created, I've realized that um, forgiveness to myself, but also to other people, because other people say pretty messed up things. Um, and so how to absorb that, how to handle that, um, and how to forgive in some cases, which I have a hard time with, but nonetheless. Um, so guilt to comfort, fear to courage, hopelessness to hope. And most of all, for me, this has been the most important one, isolation to community. It is communities like the ones that me and Gina are currently, me, Gina, and Maya are in, that us doing this helps us to rethink our stutter, to um, put, to help us um, embrace ourselves more and that community is a key key part and um, and but also everybody else has their icebergs too and I hope that as a culture as a community as Americans as people that we could start to go toward an iceberg that is less just stigmatizing so that's what I wanted to say about that Thank you, Nina. And G G Gina, did, did, did you want to expand on anything N Nina was saying, or we can kind of move on to the next topic? Uh, no, I just want to say I, I love her revised um, iceberg. Like uh, When I went to my first NSA conference in 2010, um, I remember seeing the iceberg for the first time, like Sheehan's iceberg. And um, you know, while it was true, you know, like, yes, I can relate to that experience. Like, it is important to have, like, a more empowering narrative around stuttering. Um, and, it, you know, we're talking about the media, and the media, we don't see empowering narratives around stuttering often. I was going to say at all, but that's not exactly true, but often. Um, and, or, you know, they're, it's problematic. <laughs> It's problematic, um, you know, it's not quite accurate and it portrays information that is not helpful for people who stutter, honestly. And, you know, um, we need to educate people and people need to educate themselves. And I think they need to view stuttering as not all a bad thing. And I really like your podcast, Maya, about how it's about like diversity, like, um, you know, verbal diversity. And um, I think we have a long way to go, but I love the conversation that's being had now and moving in the more positive direction. And um, yeah, so that's what I want to say. And, and that's why right now is so exciting because the media piece, like part of why images in movies and TV shows suck is because we're not the ones who are writing it um and even if we are in the foreground we're not in the background um and a good example of that is um my 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 cousin Vinny, where the actor actually stuttered and didn't uh, the character's not great um and if we can it, it what's nice is that with the directness of social media we're able to put out our voices and our projects and 
our own views of stuttering so that they don't have to be filtered through a network or movie studio. Yeah, and just to add on to now that we're talking about representation in TV, film, media, um, I was so excited to meet this young actress who stutters and I actually, um, she's gonna be in season two and she told me a story about how she was casted in a limited series animated show where the main character was a woman who stutters and the character was actually based on her. And so she really, not only as an actress, but she actually had like her being herself, like that was part of the, mm -hmm. the creation of the character. And so that just, made me so hopeful of, of, you know, more projects where people who stutter are the, the, the central character and it's nuanced and it's, and it, and even a projects where stuttering isn't front and center, but just like a normalized thing. And so I know, you know, there are great examples coming, but if you look at past movies, it's, it's not, it's not, pretty. So um, um, at least, you know, there's, um, you know, yeah, there's just a lot more opportunity for that. Um, and another thing I'm, another topic that could be related that I'm curious about hearing from you guys is um, like having multiple identities. Um, for me, I, I never claimed that I was a person who stuttered. And now that I'm claiming it, it's intersecting with all of these other identities I have, like being a writer and being an advocate. And um, I used to do all of this work around di 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 different issues like climate change and affordable housing. And I feel like there is this powerful way to combine those things and have stuttering be part of all the, these movements and have these movements be part of stuttering because no matter what, like we as stutters, we're everywhere. Some of us are hidden. Some of us are not. Like Nina said, we're 1% of the population. So that's 1% of each city, which is kind of a lot of people. And so um, I was wondering if you guys can just touch on intersectionality and how you're stuttering intersects with your other identities and how we can build allyship with other um, movements and groups? It's a really great question. And um, yeah, so about my personal background. Um, so I am, um, my father's African-American, my mother's Chinese American. And um, so growing up, you know, um, if you come to my parents' house, you'll see they have, they're, they're really big on integrating African art and Asian art into the house. And that was just always there. Um, and, uh, you know, we never really had like big discussions about what it means that we're like a multiracial, biracial family, whatever you want to call it. It was just like the reality and it was just my family. Um, and, uh, they really integrated that though and really worked hard to teach me and my sister, I have a sister, um, about both cultures and to be proud of both cultures. And that, that was a huge thing is the pride, um, you know, not being ashamed, knowing the history, knowing, you know, everything that kind of led up to this point, but also being proud. And, um, um, and with my stuttering, I think, interestingly, you know, it, uh, my my family has no experience with stuttering. <laughs> Basically, I'm the only one that I know of in my family who stutters. Uh, so they were more kind of of the opinion, like, okay, well, you have to work to um, you have to work to kind of hide this. Like, this is going to be something that's going to hold you back, and it's going to you know people are going to pigeonhole you if they find out. So I got pressure from that. It was so interesting how like contrasting that was to the other messages about my identity. Um, 
but that's the way it was. And I think, you know, I, I think they were trying to protect me, but, um, you know, stuttering pride is something that is, um, I still kind of feel like uh, I'm, I'm like trying to kind of wrap my, my head around. Like I do feel it at times and when I'm with the community and I think like having that community has allowed me to have the pride, but I didn't really find a stuttering community really uh, until, you know, I was in my twenties, my mid twenties or so, but that really um, fostered a sense of pride. And I think pride is really important when it comes to identity period and also with all these various, um, you know, intersecting identities. Um, so yeah, that's what I have to really say about that right now. I might add more later. <laughs> I think for me, um, it's um, be, having multiple disabilities has always been kind of a weird experience because people will think that my stutter is the bigger issue when my dyslexia is a way bigger issue. I mean, there's a reason why there is a cloud around me and this, and this filters on. And that's because, you know, there's some things around here that are a mess. And now I don't have to worry about that because it's all blurred out. Um, and so my my learning disabilities impact me so much more, but people don't have to deal with that in the same way that they deal with my stutter. So um, I kind of experienced that experience very much in isolation because it's even though people who have dyslexia, we're a bigger population than people who stutter, we don't go out and find each other, especially as adults. It's like once we're out as special ed, we're like, oh, good, we don't have to see these people ever again. Um, and so that's something that I kind of struggle with is that and I did come from a disabled household. My dad is hard of hearing. His dad was hard of hearing. His, my grandfather's mom was hard of hearing. So in terms of family, I'm fourth generation di disabled, which I feel that that kind of set me along the path in a way that um, I, my identity as a person with a disability, like I, I didn't have the stigma. I think a lot of other people do. It was just like, oh, that's just family. It's just my dad has that. I have this. My grandmother has that. My grandfather has this. Um, so d disability in my family was really, really, it was, it was weird for people not to have one. Um, so I was very l lucky in that way. Um, I do think, you know, I, it, being, being a Catholic or being raised Catholic at least, um, I, I just went to a mass that a friend actually, like, I don't know if you could, as a lay person that you could throw a mass, but she threw a mass that was, as um, it was a mass for families and people that have di di disabilities. And for me being back in church with that as an inclusive thing was very different than the church that I was raised in. And it brought up just a lot of my, like, I don't want to say trauma because it's not like it was like other people have much bigger issues, but it's like this um, small T trauma around the church and around things that they've done and around, you know, not being an inclusive part, of, you know, like when I was a kid, I would want to read a petition in in church and I wasn't called on because of my speech. And there are those things like that, that I wasn't felt, I didn't feel that I was an inclusive part of, along with all the other kinds of injuries that many people in the Catholic church have felt um, without getting too much into it. Um, so yeah, there's, um, I think there's a spiritual piece of stuttering that we don't always talk about um, and I've been feeling that a little bit more than, um, than I have in the past because of this 
recent experience where I saw the validation happen and I was like, uh, I never had that. What does that mean for me now? Yeah, for me, when I think of my intersecting identities in the present, so my full-time job is I advocate for, um, to help bring more resources and to um, have better structures for local journalism and ethnic media in California. And I work at a nonprofit that also works on like voting rights issues and um, how to make voting more accessible for people with disabilities. And, um, and so there, and a lot of other pro democracy type of policies. And I, I've been really thinking lately of how I can combine that issue that I've become passionate about and also stuttering advocacy. And I think there's so much opportunity there to um, use policy and all of these um and all of th these ways to actually through policy give recognition to different communities as a way to spread more awareness and shift the narrative locally and also to force people in power to listen to, to us as stutters and what we want and so i think the opportunity i see for people who stutter is to have to like be our own voting block and it doesn't have to be issues just around stuttering like we have opinions around all of these di different issues like animal rights and climate justice and education and housing and we our voices deserve to be part of the di decisions that are being made at every level of government so that's definitely something I've been thinking about lately with all these different, wearing my um, nonprofit media and democracy hat and then wearing my stuttering advocacy hat. So um, very exciting stuff. And um, I didn't wanna pivot again to um, another topic just around accessibility um, since, you know, we, I do, consider myself someone with a disability with, with my stutter and I know accessibility challenges comes in all shapes and sizes and the three of us have all had our share of um of you know ableism and so I think it'd be really helpful to talk about like what are some of the the, the challenges when it comes to accessibility and how can people um like how can we overcome the narrative that ex accessibility is hard, right? Um, it's actually not hard at all. And so um, I, I want to pass it over to Nina to, to talk about her experience in universal design and how she moves through that world. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, of course I am. Um, so, um, you know, I think that when we talk about different kinds of disabilities, um, we always think about the barriers. Of course, the barrier, like the main one, um, is attitudes. And, um, and that is the one that is shared amongst people who use wheelchairs, little people, people who stutter, the gamut is attitudes is the biggest issue because you can have the most accessible place ramps everywhere but if the people there suck then the access there sucks too um now with that being said how does universal design which is the design of environments to be used by as many people as possible that is a goal within the disability community but it's that that in that inclusiveness is something that should be built into everything and what i oftentimes see is that people build a building brand new thing and then they forget to put an elevator in for this floor they may have it for this thing but they may not have it for this thing so there is a lack of access and it's much more expensive and much and it takes a lot more time to put the access in at the end 
So the access really needs to be built into projects, built into environments. And when I say environments, like when you think about these things, you oftentimes think of a building, but an environment is a classroom, an environment is a website, an environment is a podcast, it's a movie that to think about how access needs to be there um, and to build that in very early on. Um, and one example that I used to have, they don't have it much anymore, but in Safeway, they used to ask, would you like help out? And they ask that to absolutely everybody. So that if you needed assistance um, because of a disability, it was there. If you needed assistance because you were a parent and had a full load in your arms um, and needed some assistance putting bags in, they got that too. And they just treated everybody as if it was normal to need assistance because it is normal to need assistance. Um, and so to think about that in terms of stuttering, that there is diversity in how we talk. There is um, any of us, we don't look like we stutter because that doesn't have a look to it. Um, and so how can people approach the world in a way that however we talk is a valid way to talk. And that may mean challenging our own assumptions as people who stutter, but also assumptions of people who don't stutter um, and making access. And, you know, we are talking about, you know, like we have the captioning right now going on. I did not put it on because I knew it'd be such a distraction for our stutters because I was like, oh, that's how it is interpreting what I said. Um, so there are issues like that, but then there's also just issues of how we come into something and the funny looks we get. There's, and I know Gina and Maya have, have that, that they've get, gotten this, where people just kind of look weird, like, oh, what, what's she doing right now? And sometimes it's a look of pity. Sometimes it's a look of WTF. So it can vary. And I think what we need is to know that there are multiple ways to talk. There are There is diversity in how we talk. And for the world to be more stutter friendly, um, people will just need to kind of go with the flow in a way that doesn't further st stigmatize us at, when we open our mouths. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, and I feel like, I'm curious what you guys think because you know, you've been doing comedy and spreading awareness, disability advocacy for many years. Maya, you have your podcast, Raising Awareness About Stuttering. And um, it seems like, yeah, it seems like to me, people are slow to catch on to understanding what you just said. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, and I have experienced this like on a, I wanna say like a global scale, but also like an individual scale where, um, you know, I can tell someone, um, you know, when I stutter, just be patient, don't give me the look, whatever it is, let me finish what I'm gonna say, and they will still trip up. Um, and, you know, everyone makes mistakes, you know, everyone kind of, but I mean, um, it does seem like, yeah, it's, it's tough to get people to, um, really, you know, respond to stuttering in the way that feels supportive and not stigmatizing. And, um, and I don't know what it will take to kind of get people to understand that. I feel like, you know, you guys are doing great work in raising awareness, but I'm sure you've had experiences too. And, um, you know, and I know it takes time for change, but uh, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, I kind of, um, and ready for the world to change a little bit. We talk about like the social model of disability being like you yourself, the person with the 
disability, the person who stutters, is not the problem and you don't have to fix yourself to merge and you know blend in with the quote unquote normal people. It's actually the world itself that needs to adapt. And um, I think that, yeah, like there's there's been a lot of great work out there and yet there's like still so much like misinformation um, and mishandling of people who stutter in so many situations. And yeah, I'm kind of curious what you guys think of that and like, what do you think is going to move the needle? <laughs> but yeah, that's my takeaway. Maya, do you want to go first or should I? You, you, you can go. I'll follow okay. you. Okay. <laughs> um, I, you know, what I really love about comedy is that um, it's the one environment where I have led with my stutter because I say it like one of the first things I say is about the stutter. Everybody in the comedy world knows I stutter. They all have heard my act over and over and over again that you don't interrupt, don't interrupt, don't interrupt. Um, they have some hacky jokes, um, and, but my jokes are better. So I just come at them. And also they know that if I've done, like I always know when I've done well to an audience, because if the person after me makes a, a stuttering joke, the audience doesn't laugh. And so, because they like me and not this other person. So it can kind of poison the next comic if they make fun of me. Um, so for me, it's so weird because comedy is full of assholes, but they've been pretty cool about my stutter. I think there's been some people who may think that it's a gimmick or that I'm just a, a stuttering comic. And that's because they're not really li listening to me. Um, and for me, it's been weird to have a microcosm of this because um, I, I have spent some time in academia and the ableism in there is more than in comedy. There are more assholes in academia around my stutter and around my dyslexia than comedy um so I think that it's helped for me to be my most authentic self in that environment um and um and to be also to be able to say you're being an asshole stop that and I'm saying asshole a lot because it's like the dirty word I feel I can get 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 get, get away with here um and so I like when you in, in comedy, when you receive a microaggression from another comic, it's not gonna be a subtle one where like, oh, was it that? Did they mean that? Did they say this? No, it's gonna be them saying like the most egregious thing so that you can respond in a way that um, like respond on 10 and just go off on the person and it's all okay. And so everything is out there more. And so I really appreciate that community because of that and because it is set up in that way. Yeah, and um, just responding to the accessibility question. So um, I really enmeshed myself in the podcasting community um, and it's just been such an amazing way to spread awareness because there's so many d different types of podcasters. And so um, a lot of people learn about Proud Stutter because I'm just always trying to educate other podcasters about stuttering and even editors of podcasts. Like I've talked to them and now they're kind of shifting how they edit their podcasts for their clients based on like me educating them about stuttering. And so um, so I think to answer your question, Gina, about like, how can we really move the needle? It's just, um, showing up in other spaces, like Nina, you're showing up in the comedy world and so many other spaces and Gina, you're, um, you're, you know, sharing your art through film and, and writing and, and having your, um, empathy through your, um, and, 
and even though you're it might not like our content might not be touching on stuttering art as artists who stutter we're still making a difference having our perspective and with podcasting um while i'm hopeful because so many of the podcasters i know creators are so open to learning about stuttering the industry itself has a long way to, to go and one example that's really unfortunate is um like their their how some companies market um their software and, and tools is really problematic and one example is there's this um this new tool called clean voice um which already has like a ton of problems with the name of it um and the one of the the, the the things on their website it says is although your content may be great if the listening experience is poor people are likely to tune out <laughs> we analyze various factors like stuttering to determine a score so <laughs> they actually give you a more negative score if they catch stuttering in the podcast episode so <laughs> i've been calling that example out as much as i can <laughs> and any podcast um, event I'm part of, that's going to be like my number one example, because then people are going to be like, oh, Maya's going to call me out unless I get my act together. So, <laughs> um, so that's just, I should share that because not to like, um, you know, talk negatively about the podcast industry, but it's just to kind of give you an example of, you know, there is ableism that still exists out there. And um, and how we shift the narrative is really to just show up and share our tr truth, share our, our stories. And I know not everyone is there in their journey and that's okay. But the, the more we're out there with our story telling, with our art, the more um, we'll be able to make the world a better place for people who stutter. Um, and I see that we have a hand raised, so I will open it up to that and um, I will open it up for Gary to speak. All right, I like the fact that y'all are talking about your disabilities, uh, studying and things of that nature. Where well, my disability is ADHD. Sometimes my processing goes real fast and sometimes my processing goes real slow. Where well, I have this irritating bunch of people that are part, like part family that they go out of their way to interfere with what I'm trying to do with my life, you know, and they sabotage, they try to sabotage it. They run and tell my boss this and run and tell my boss that. And then all the people at my job are looking at me weird and I'm starting to feel all insecure, right? Well, this process is going on today. <laughs> it, it's been like this for the last four days. This is my first day at work and I'm getting to attend this beautiful this conference. So it helps me settle down some and, and, and get my proof. Um, I'm not on medication, so sometimes I self-medicate to slow myself down. And I know it ain't right, but as long as it doesn't affect my performance or my work ethics, it shouldn't be no issue. Now, I don't need people running behind my back uh, saying, he's doing this, doing this, doing this, and making up lies to go along with it. Now, I look at him and my boss say, oh, are you doing that? Oh, yeah, I'm doing this. And they go, well, why are you not doing that? And they say, you told the truth. So my integrity is still there, you know? And that's what I base myself on, is having strong integrity. Then they try to make me look dumb on my computer because I'm, I'm like a, a nerd when it comes to laptops, phones. I don't know how to get around them very well. I was trying to message something and I couldn't get my message out because <laughs> it's, a, it's a Macintosh and I'm kind of like, oh, wow. They're not letting me do this. So I'm gonna raise my hand and say what I want to say. You know, just so I can get it off my chest and, and let you know that I'm enjoying listening to the three ladies speak about the studying, because I do study sometimes. I used to study a lot when I got hit in the head back in 97. So I worked on that. Uh, I thought, you nah, know, I ain't got no teeth, so I mispronounced articulate words incorrectly. So I have big issues, but thank God I'm just supporting it. <laughs> I don't have to do any actual or podcasting or anything like that, but I, I love that part of it. You know, I, I'm an old school uh, broadcaster, a media broadcaster from the 70s, uh, from Oakland. And so this is like a 
a brush up for some learning, you know, new technology now. And then I'm teaching some uh, other people that I set up a, a class for, you know, people that wanted to get into journalism and communication skills. And I have a great professor that works around with me. It was great. And I just want to thank y'all for sharing that I've studying. But there's a lot of other disabilities that people don't even realize that we go through and we have challenges every day that we do in this field. And I just wanted to, to say that because I know they listening, so they may back off of me and email, you know, because they're making it hard on me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Gary. Yeah, what I mean, what I love about these spaces is there's just so much connection between all of our lived experiences. And it just, it brings me a lot of warmth to share in those experiences. Um, and it makes me think that there's so much we can do together as people with different lived experiences, but also through our differences, we can bond on a lot of things as well and I so I really appreciate you bringing your energy into th this space thank you so do um Nina or Gina, do you have anything you want to add to what Gary has said or do, do you kind of want to shift gears a little bit? I mean, I like this, this listen about different areas about disabilities. Like, I don't hear very well because I was a mess of that too. So I go, I'm going through a lot of stuff. And I'm 63 years old and I'm just starting out on a new career. So you can imagine the, the fear that I have. And this is the first time I actually helped write a program. And it's really a, like, oh man, these people are taking a uh, risk on me. I don't want to mess up. But it seems like every time I try to do the right thing, I got people in my way and I want to run over them, but I can't because it's not in my heart to be that way, you know? And I want to give my all in all all the time. So yeah, I'm just a screwed up old man that's trying to start a new career and it happens mm -hmm. to be media, journalism, and all that good stuff. I, you know, I work for a newspaper and, and it's great. You know, I, I'm starting to feel comfortable writing because I can't spell. So I had to use other methods to get my uh, stories out. And my first publishing published story came out very well. It was, wow, I was shocked. You know, it, it, and so I'm gonna start writing a column once a month. And it's gonna take me about a month to write the column. So, <laughs> because I'm very slow at it. Uh, but I got a great editor and I work with a great organization that works with a lot of people that have disabilities. And so uh, this is a real touching subject for me because uh, I'm around other disabled people all the time. And I'm appreciative that I came to this particular session. That's all I want to say. Here, you know, let's see you, you got it. <laughs> and um, Gary, what organization do you work for again? Pardon me. I what organization? Um, what organization are you? Oh, I'm I'm with the organization for? Street Roots. Uh, we sell newspaper, social justice newspaper. Okay. And cool. Yeah. So it's because and we yeah. advocate and and do a lot of different things. So I'm learning something I never knew about. You know, the nonprofit world. I never knew anything about. I was in the profit world, uh, aerospace for 25 years, and they got hit in the head. So it's a Big change, but there's a lot to learn. And it, it let me know that my brain still works. So I had I've suffered from brain damage. And uh, it's it's quite a rewarding challenge, you know. And I'm very appreciative of this organization. So you can find us at www.streetboots.org. And you can find out information about us. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we're we're the 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 three of us are also based in the the Bay Area. So, oh, you in the Bay? I, was, I used to stay in the Bay. In Oakland, in Alameda. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in San Francisco, of course. I, it's all over the Bay. I moved up here to Oregon. Get away from you got lots of Bay Area representation here, so that's wonderful. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> I know I'm going to learn a lot now. 
<laughs> so I was thinking since, you know, we are kind of getting to the end of our panel, um, um, I was thinking a, a great way to end for is for us um, to go around and talk about what are some actions people can take to su support the stuttering community. And if you wanna even go further with, um, you know, other, I mean, I know we're talking about stuttering, but if there's other things you wanna talk about about how to su support your art as well. So let's start with Gina um, and we can just go around to say like what, how we can support the stuttering community in our individual projects. Yeah, um, well, I just want to really quickly thank Gary for, you know, sharing. It was really nice to hear a little bit about you and your story and, you know, can relate and, um, yeah, just the relatability <laughs> on so many levels in these communities. And, um, you know, what you said, Gary, about, like, kind of other people kind of <laughs> getting in your way, like, like, you know, I think it sounds like we're all pretty like driven, like people with a vision that we want to, you know, live out, we want to create, we want to manifest it. And, um, you know, these things, you know, are disabilities um, and the way people respond to them really. And the way that we have internalized shame and all that, like we've talked about today, it has been, you know, can be a barrier. And so I think that I love the idea of people starting to adapt a mindset of like a verbal diversity or just like all diversity and just like really challenging their ten tendency. And this is me in this group too, challenging your tendencies to make assumptions um, and being willing to ask people how they wanna be treated and being willing to listen and try your best to integrate it, you know, like, if you ask us, if you ask me, for example, like, how do you want me to respond to your stuttering, Gina? Or, you know, like, how do you want me to support you? Like, I can tell you. And I think, like, you know, just to give some examples, yeah, like, just um, let me talk and, um, you know, let me finish what I have to say. Don't try to interrupt me. Don't try to finish my sentence. Don't try to guess what I'm going to say. Really just, um, you know, and treat, like, treat what I have to say as important as anybody else. And um, it was touched on earlier about how like the, the frustration with stuttering, like being at least partly like how people might perceive you as less intelligent. And um, that's really hard to be thought of that way. And yet, you know, I think um, that's something that everyone should challenge in themselves about the assumptions that they make about people for you know, whatever reason. Um, there may be more to, more to it than you realize or you think at first blush. So um, yeah, just, just like being open and patient and willing, willing to learn and change and grow, which I know is easy to say, but not always easy to enact. Um, and um, it also you know, made me think about I think we had this conversation, uh, Maya, when we met um, in San Francisco the other month, but the idea of like, you know, as artists who stutter, basically, as creators who stutter, like, I always at least personally felt like, well, I don't want to just have to create art that has to do with stuttering, <laughs> you know, well, just like, I don't always want to just have to create art that, that has to do with being Black or being Chinese. and. Um, and I think like, that's what I wanna see more of is just like being able to tell your story and not have to lead with your identity so much. And that'd be the first thing out of your mouth. That'd be the first thing that, because, and I think that that's really a reflection of society too, that a lot of us feel that we have to start with that. And it's like, well, you know, you guys can get over this other stuff. Like I wanna sh share my art. Mm -hmm. the way that I want to share my art and that's like the freedom that I want for people who stutter and people with all disabilities is like to be able to just share their art and not have to lead with a disability necessarily unless they want to um mm -hmm. so yeah um 
yeah so in terms of supporting us you know like support our work <laughs> buy our books and our products um talk to people and um just share the information that we have shared today and be willing to listen be be willing to ask questions and ask people how they want to be treated um and then work your hardest to apply it i think and um, ask people how you you can be an ally and they will tell you and then work, work your hardest to embody that Yeah, and I mean, Gina went over it really, really well. I think um, for me in comedy, um, I think that producers think that if there's any kind of intersectionality um, in comedy and disability, that people's heads will explode, which is why a lot of the comics who do get um, featured in stand-up specials on TV are disabled white guys and they are really great comics and they deserve to be there but there's also other people who have a different perspective that maybe women and disabled maybe people of color and disabled and those experiences need to be featured as well so I hope that um that we see more of that um and also comedy that reflects a disabled experience from the inside instead of from the outside i think sometimes the comedy that becomes like that panders to the able-bodied experience is what you'll see more of in popular culture and I hope that we can um, have 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 ha that we can have more disabled comedy that is from the insider's po point of view. Yeah, and just echoing what everyone said, I um, yeah, I think for me. Um, is su supporting our work is is huge and also just specifically to stuttering like if you have someone who stutters in your life or um and do you want to su support them just um just tr like understanding is is huge and there's so many resources out there to help you learn about the, the stuttering experience and who knows maybe you'll even identify with a lot of a lot of what stutters go through and a great place to start is um i just put a few links in the chat like those with that that's where you can find us to learn more about our our art and our stuttering journey and that's how we're using our experience to express ourselves and so that's kind of that would be my re re recommendation and also just from an advocacy perspective like me as a stuttering advocate i want to join i want to um like collaborate with other people that are in journalism and education and all these other industries that do have a lot of overlap with our experience and i just want to use our shared passions to show up and just spread more awareness about all of our um all of our issues and so i welcome that and um yeah gary i mean i i loved what you, you said and i um i i do come from a media and journalism advocacy background with my full-time job. So I'd love to connect with you in some way around that piece. Um, especially, I, I'm really, I really am always asking people who are journalists about like, what does their disability coverage look like? And a lot of people give me the, the same response, like, oh, we're, we haven't done that yet, but we're working on it. And I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> Um, um, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of say that. Um, thank you. Um, 
I appreciate the, the three of you uh, speaking and sharing with you with your uh, lived experience. My lived experience is that I used to stutter when I got hit in the head and had plastic surgery in '97, and I worked very hard to get rid of that stuttering because I was also into broadcasting, so I didn't want to like lose my radio voice, but I still lost my radio voice because I got all my teeth pulled out. And I get, uh, I guess you call, call frame, uh, frozen mind, where you think you want to say something, then you lose it, and then you can't remember what it is. Uh, the hardest lesson for me, I guess, is this lesson I'm learning today, is uh, being pushed, uh, being angry and being pushed and wanting to lash back, you know, uh, I shouldn't allow myself to do this, but I do. Because if I sit on my hands and need hands and, and you know, and not say anything or do anything to help my cause, then people would not believe it. I've always been a fighter, you know. And that's why I guess I spoke out so abruptly because I was fighting back from the tyranny that I've been going through. Because uh, this has been a long road for me, a long two years. This is my third year process. Uh, I had got into a major felony, and I, uh, man, this is, and I went to the mental health court, but I got mental issues too. And this 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 company took me in and worked with me, not against me, to allow me to grow and blossom. Right now, I'm just kind of angry and, and feeling belittled and, and, and betrayed. Uh, that's maybe the reason I sound like I sound, but I feel really betrayed. Because it's like a big setup. You know, you bother me all night, then you want to set me up. That they, in the morning, you're going to have to eat all these people here to say, oh, this is what he's doing. Oh my God, what is this? I mean, I'm a grown adult. Where, 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 does, where does my privacy start? You know, it's being violated. You know, and that's what I, that's, I think that's one of the biggest challenges that I face being disabled, being able to stand up for my privacy and my civil rights, you know, because people don't want to listen to uh, people that have disabilities or they think we're stupid. That's the word that I use. Oh, he's stupid. Well, my definition of stupid is, yes, it's a genius that's believing in a lie. So I don't think I'm that stupid because I don't believe in all the lies that society teach. You know? But um, I just think, I just want to thank you girls for allowing me a chance to get some of this pressure off my chair so I can make it to the rest of the conference you know, as the day go, and maybe ease down and uh, really progress a little better than what I'm picking up. But I'm glad I tuned in uh, because this is something I hadn't even thought about in my program, these disabilities, you know. What about these disabilities? How can I implement something that's going to cover this for those people that are learning how to become journalists or communication, you know, podcasts, interviewing? So how can I help them get past that point? And I'm glad I came so it makes me think, oh yeah, I need to start thinking about those issues. You know, I forgot that I had these issues, but now I need to think about these issues. So it was a good, it was a good, good sounding board and I'm learning what I need to start thinking about. This is my first year in the program and so it's a lot to be, uh, you know, put together and, and figure out the do's and the don'ts. You know, we had the power, it went well, now we're in the actual flow of things. So, uh, I'm still nervous. I'm new at it. And yeah, so now you can reach me. At, I can't get this thing to send the message, but I'm at Gary at streetroots.org. That's my email. Street, street yeah. booth? Yeah, street root. Gary at streetroots.org. Street roots. Okay. Uh, S, yeah, S T R E E. Well, that's E E P R O O. I mean, R O O T S. Okay, got it. Okay, yeah, got you, it. You can reach me at that email anytime. And I politely answer back, send information that I ha might have, or you can send me some information that you have. Be happy to collaborate with you. And you're Thank in Oakland? You. In Oakland area, the Bay Area? San nice. Francisco. San Francisco would be great. Uh, empathy Circles, I've been through that too already. So, yeah, we can talk. Thank you for letting me share. I'm yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a wonderful place to to end. And um, I don't know if if Gina or me, Nina wanted to kind of close with their thoughts, but I think 
this was a great conversation and I'm excited to share it out with the, the public. I think um, it's, it's gonna do a lot for our community. Also, I wanted to acknowledge Romina's um, chat too, and thank you for coming and so glad um, you could be here to start to process uh, a lot of that stuff. So thank you. And, and thank you, Gary. Yeah, and I, I just wanna say thank you to Romina and Gary and Nina and Maya, obviously, and our interpreters. Um, it's been a lovely conversation and I, I just, um, you know, let, let's continue the conversation. You know, it, it's an ongoing journey. And um, so it's important to create spaces like these. And I'm grateful that we got to have one today. All righty.